As you guys know, I love making costumes and prop replicas. And for a while now, I've had this idea of making some costume-inspired pieces that aren't cosplay, but that are inspired by costumes that I love and that can be worn as everyday clothing. Sort of this everyday cosplay idea. So the only things that I've really made in this realm so far are I made Rey's vest from Star Wars, and I also made a cowl inspired by the Lord of the Rings cloaks. I recently thrifted a green dress, which was calling out for a statement belt. So I decided to design a corset belt to go with this dress. The inspiration for this everyday cosplay project is Tauriel from the Hobbit movies. Now as a lifelong book fan I just could never get on board with that character. I think she's an incredible character. I think the actress did an amazing job. Just not in the Hobbit please. I now watch a fan edit which has edited her out but I love her costume. Her costume is incredible. It's probably my favorite female costume from any Tolkien adaptation. So I studied the costume looking for some design elements I could use in my belt. You can see that there are vines on the front of her bodice and there's also the curves along the side. So those were the two main elements that I wanted to include. I just designed my vines from scratch because you can't see the original ones clearly enough to do any copying. The leaves in mine I decided to use Malorn leaves because obviously I created a very basic corset belt pattern for myself and then drew a really messy sketch of the basics of the vines. Then I digitized my pattern and tidied it up a little bit adding some extra elements as I went along. The link to the pattern will be down below. As with all of my patterns you can print it in either US letter or an A4 paper. I always include test squares which you can measure to make sure that it printed out correctly. So I cut out the leather. I used 10 ounce veg tan cowhide for this project. I just cut the paper pattern out and then traced around it onto the leather to get the shape. I cut my leather out using a sharp X-Acto knife and a cutting mat. Here I'm just beveling the edges of the leather. Now this is not a requirement, but it does make a little bit of a cleaner look. And if you bevel the backside edges can make it just a little bit more comfortable. So I'm gonna start transferring the pattern for the tooling. I'm gonna case the leather. Now there are a bunch of different ways of doing this and I do do it differently depending on the situation. But in this case, I'm not doing any shaping of the leather. I'm just doing tooling. So what I'm doing is I have a sponge. This is just water and I'm dampening the surface of the leather. So I'm doing this to all my pieces. I'm adding it as evenly as possible. Possible. Basically, you want to get it to the point where it's damp enough that it stops just slurping up the water. And this is really something that you kind of have to go by feel and experience. There are YouTube tutorials that go into way more detail about this. I'll link to one down below. If you don't have experience casing and tooling, I do recommend practicing on some scrap because it is a little bit of a getting the correct vibe situation. Basically, the end goal is that you want to have a decent amount of dampness on the inside of the leather, but the surface is a little bit drier. The amount of water required is really going to change depending on how warm it is, how humid it is, how thick your leather is. There are so many variables, which is why it's really hard for me to just say, do this, it'll work every time, because that's just not how it works. Where I live is super dry, especially in the winter time, so things dry so fast. If you live somewhere humid, it's a completely different story. So you're starting to see now that the water is taking a longer time to soak in. You're starting to see now that when I put the water on, it's being slower to soak in. When you first start putting the water on, it's just gonna slurp that up immediately. Now it's starting to get damper, which means that the water is going in more slowly. And that's an indication that I'm getting closer to where I wanna be. Once it's totally wet, I'm gonna let it soak in for a little bit. I know some people will leave their leather overnight. I am too impatient for that kind of nonsense, but there's a lot of different methods for trying to get the perfect case leather. Okay, so I'm gonna start transferring my pattern. Basically, I'm just putting my pattern directly onto the leather. You can put a layer of saran wrap in between if you wanna stop your leather from getting wet. Personally, it's a small piece and I usually just print a fresh pattern every time. So I don't have a problem with the pattern getting a little bit wet. I'm going to trace over top of my lines. You can use a stylus for this. I personally like to use a pencil because then I can see which lines I've already traced, which makes it easier to keep track of. Basically, all this is doing is just putting a little bit of an indent into the leather so that you can see the lines after you remove the paper. There's a lot of lines to trace on the front of this. You do want to make sure that your pattern doesn't shift around while you're in the middle of tracing, otherwise things aren't going to line up. 
So now you can see the indent of the pattern on the leather. So I'm going to go straight into my tooling because I want to do this while my leather is still damp. First off, I'm using a swivel knife. I personally like swivel knives with an angled blade. And I used to use a metal one, but I've switched to using a ceramic blade and I do really like it. It doesn't require sharpening the same way that a metal blade does, or at least that's what I've been told. I haven't had it long enough to really get a sense of how durable it is. Now, people who are bosses with a swivel knife can do curves and curly cues without moving their leather at all. So you'll see me spinning my leather constantly I am completely self-taught, so everything that I do, I did figuring it out on my own, and a lot of the things that I do are not quote-unquote correct, but I just do what works for me. Carving with a swivel knife can be a bit of a strange motion when you're starting out, so again, practice on some scrap. I'm using the swivel knife to outline the leaves as well. Leather tooling is a very slow process. It takes a really long time, and there's a reason why tooled leather items are really expensive. It is super, super time consuming and there's no shortcut. You just have to go slow and steady. I'm just checking the two side by side to make sure that they match. These aren't on the pattern, but I decided to add a few little dots just to create some extra texture. This is just a little stylus with a rounded tip. Where I live is very, very dry. We have very little humidity. And it is the middle of summer, so it's also really hot. Ideally, you would want to do all of your tooling without having to re-wet your leather. Unfortunately, things are drying so fast right now that I did have to re-wet my leather as I went along. I could have helped prevent that by working on one piece at a time as opposed to wetting all of my leather pieces all at once. So now I'm going to start my tooling. This is where you can get creative. I mean, you don't have to do any tooling. You could just do the swivel knife cuts. Um, there's a lot of different background textures you could use. There's a lot of different ways that you could do this. So this is the part where you get to make it your own and do whatever you like. I decided to start with some background texture. I'll link to what tool I'm using down below. I really am a major beginner when it comes to backgrounding. So don't take anything that I do here as necessarily the correct way. I'm overlapping the tool as I go and I'm spinning it around so that it doesn't look like the same stamp over and over again. I sort of started hammering really deep around the leaves and then decreased my pressure as I worked my way away from the leaves so that it, the impressions got a little bit less deep and a little bit lighter. Here I'm going very light. As you can see, I'm just doing a bunch of little taps just to sort of fade that background out. Continuing along, building up that texture, you can see I added some more along the edges. I just wanted to create a lot of depth and shading and not have everything be completely uniform all the way across. Now I wasn't totally sure if I was going to outline the leaves with a beveler, but I did decide to in the end and I'm really glad that I did because it made them pop. So I'm coming along with just a flat edge beveler and beveling the outside of the leaves down so that the leaves pop up. Using a beveler is a really slow process. Don't be afraid to go back over your same line. If you hammer the whole line and there's a spot that's not quite even, you can come back and hammer it again to smooth it out. It is really hard to get nice smooth lines with an edge beveler. So now I'm gonna start on the front using that swivel knife to carve the edges. With lines like this, it's best if you can just do it in one long smooth motion. Now I'm using that same background tool and I'm tooling along the edge. Again, I wanted to make the indentations deeper along the lines and then sort of fade it out as it moved across. Here I'm starting to build up that fade. You can see as I'm getting further from the edge, I'm doing shallower, faster taps just to make a really light impression and sort of fade it out. So now I'm doing the trickiest part of this whole thing, which is the front. There's a lot of little tiny curly cues here. So I'm doing all of the vines first with my swivel knife. So now I've cut all of my swivel knife patterns and I'm coming back in with the tooler. So now I'm just using a flat beveler to bevel the edges of the leaves. I am tooling around the outside so it pushes the outside down which then makes the leaves appear to come forward. I have done so, so much tooling with just two different sizes of flat edge bevelers. 
There's a lot that you can do with these tools. If you don't have a lot of money to spend on tools, but you want to start tooling, I recommend getting a swivel knife and two or three different sizes of edge bevelers. You can do so much with just those couple of tools. Some of these leaves are really small, so this is really slow and finicky. You can see here, I'm coming in, I'm not even using a hammer, but I'm just using my hand just to smooth out some of those uneven hammer lines. So I wasn't sure if I was gonna use a backgrounder around the leaves, but I did decide that it was gonna make the whole thing look just a little bit cleaner because the leaves are so small, there was just a lot of imperfect lines. So I'm coming in again with that exact same backgrounder and I'm just adding some texture, doing the same thing I did before, using different depths, different amounts of pressure, just to create some different variances in how deep these impressions are going in. So now I'm just using a stylus and I'm just tidying up some of those lines. So some of those swivel knife lines got a little bit smushed with all the tooling. So I'm going back over them to really clean them up and make them appear bigger and more obvious. So once you're done with tooling, you wanna to set your leather aside and let it dry completely. Usually this is at least overnight. You wanna be able to touch the surface and it shouldn't feel cool anymore. You want it to be totally, totally dry. Now I didn't film the dyeing process because I dyed this with my airbrush and I use my airbrush crouched on my balcony like a goblin. So sorry about that. I'm also just a beginner with an airbrush, so I don't really wanna teach anything cause I don't know what I'm doing. Here's the belt after I finished airbrushing it. I used Feebing's leather dye in buckskin color and I intentionally created this faded effect. I'm really happy with how it turned out. Again, this is another optional step, but I'm just slicking the edges down to make them a little bit smoother and cleaner. I'm just using pure water here. There's a bunch of different products you can use for this. I personally have zero patience when it comes to edge slicking. Some people will slick their edges until they're smooth as glass. I hate edge slicking. I don't know why. So I tend to do just the bare minimum of edge slicking. So I let the leather dry completely after I did my slicking. And now I'm going to add the finish. I have used so many finishes over the years and what I finally settled onto is acrylic resoline. So what I've ended up doing is watering my resoline down. I don't measure it, but I'm going to say like 50-50 maybe. I apply my resoline just with a smooth paint brush and I go over it repeatedly. You're going to see me going over the same spot over and over and over again. The reason for this is that a resoline, if there's any bubbles or any bumps or any thick areas, when it dries that will be visible. So I apply my resoline really thinly and I go over it again and again until it's basically almost dry so that I know that all the parts of it are really, really smooth. I would recommend not using a wool dauber to apply finish. You end up getting little fibers stuck in it. That's why I've gone into just using a paintbrush and this is nothing fancy. This is like cheapo 12 pack of paintbrushes that I got at the craft store. So I didn't show it, but I did three coats of this resoline, including doing the edges, letting it dry in between. So now I am adding the leather antique. So this is Feebing's antique paste. I'm wearing gloves. Trust me, you want to wear gloves. I'm just using my finger to rub this into the surface. So this isn't going to dye the surface because I have finish on top of it, but what it is going to do is settle into all of the little indents and cracks. So you want to make sure that you're using it quite thick and you're using a circular motion so that it goes down into all of your little indents and little bumps and it's all deep down in there. Now, fairly quickly, you wanna rub the excess off of the surface. You wanna use something flat because you don't wanna scrape it out of your indents. All that I'm using here is just a folded up paper towel. And you can see I'm trying to use a flat hand so I don't wipe any of that antique out of the indents. I'm just wiping more and more and trying to get that excess off of there. You can already see the, start to see some of those lines popping out, especially my swivel knife cuttings and the vines. The shallower indents are not gonna hold as much antique, which is exactly what we want. We wanna see that multi-level effect. I'm gonna set that aside to dry while I do the other ones, and then I'm going to come back and do some extra rubbing once it's dried a little bit. This has started to really come together, but you can see that the leaves are still a bit, a bit schmucky and I'm definitely gonna do a lot more rubbing and buffing as it starts to dry. Coming back into all of my pieces and doing some extra buffing now that that antique has had a little bit of time to dry. I'm gonna let it dry completely overnight and then I'm gonna come back and do a final buff and shine. You do also wanna use finish on top of your antique, 
I used Resoline again, but this time I applied it with my airbrush so that I didn't rub any of the antique off of the surface while applying it. You can see it's got a nice sheen now and it's looking really, really nice. So now I'm just adding the laces. I actually changed the number of holes after making mine just so that it's a little bit prettier for you guys. Here I'm using a round elastic cord. You could use really anything. You could use like a cotton cord, a leather cord, you could use ribbon. Here I'm lacing this through like shoelaces. What I wanted to do was like a crisscross lacing style, but I realized I didn't make the right number of holes to make that look good. So that's why I changed it for you guys in case you want to lace it up that way. And here's the completed belt. I'm so happy with how this turned out. I think it's really pretty. I'm living my elven maiden fantasy right now. So excited to wear this. If you guys have any other ideas for everyday cosplay projects, let me know down below because this was so much fun and I definitely plan on doing more everyday cosplay designs for you guys.